Howdy, folks. It's your old pal David Cobb here coming at you on the Green News Network. This program, Democracy in Action. Uh, it is my privilege and my distinct pleasure to be welcoming back to this program Anoa Changa of MediaRevolt.org. Uh, Anoa, welcome to Democracy in Action. Thank you for having me. Great to be back again. So, you know, uh, Anoa, uh, you know, since we're going to actually be talking about race uh, and the need to have a genuine intersectional analysis as it relates to race. Uh, we've had this conversation, you and I, several times, sometimes publicly, sometimes privately. But in this instance, we're going to do it in a very concrete way. In other words, uh, th there is an abstraction or a theoretical way of thinking about it. But we have that theory, or at least I have that theory, so that I can actually act appropriately uh, in the moment. And so there really are sort of two uh, topics or subjects that I actually want to talk about. And it may make some of our viewers uh, a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to uh, urge you to stay with us and stay in it. The Zen Bodh Buddhists have a saying that when things get sharp or things get uncomfortable, that's the moment to lean into it. And that's actually what I want to do. So I do want to make sure that we uh, have a conversation, I know about your experience at the United, uh, uh, the, the peace well, delegation. I wasn't, I wasn't out for, out, because I know there's been a lot of people, but I wasn't at UNIC. I was at People Summit the week before, but I was not at UNIC. Uh, Jacqueline Lukman actually was at, at the UNIC uh, uh, conference the following weekend. But I'll right. just, because I know there's Thanks. been a little, there's so many, there's so much fact, there's so much that doesn't flying around about everything, but no, I, I was not present. Other okay. So, but, so let's actually, thank you for that. So, so you weren't there, but tell me what you do know. And I know that you were very involved in uh, unpeeling that uh, on social media. And then we'll talk about the Green Party Convention. And I also want to make sure we talk about a third thing, and that is the upcoming Democracy Convention, where you and I and hundreds of other people uh, who are social change agents are going to be about that as well in the two panels <laughs> and then I get to go lead. Um, first, I just want to say that this has been a pretty wild past, I mean, it's been a pretty wild past several months, I guess, for a lot of people post-election, right? But but really thinking about just the way this conversation about race within our movement spaces. I mean, we may have the right platform language, we may have the people out there saying the right phrases and at the rallies and hashtag Black Lives Matter. But when we really get down to the, the how we organize, build relationships, and structure movement building, um, this is a historical issue. This is not a new issue. It's not because the Bernie people were racist and suddenly came to the Green Party, or the Democrats are racist. They're blaming, you know, the Bernie or whatever, whatever anyone's scenario is, or that you know people are just being divisive and talking about divisive identity politics, and we all just need to get along and make this work, take down the like, take down capitalism. It's so much more nuanced and intricate than, than any of those different scenarios that people are putting out there, primarily because either there's a basic misunderstanding or a refusal to understand actually what we mean when we talk about issues of you know white supremacy, white privilege, of racism with, built within our system that trickles down into the way that we actually organize, engage, and build. And and it it, it it's been pre it's been present throughout this whole new this newer way of progressive. Movement. I mean, we even look at, you know, the maybe lack of diversity of some aspects of Occupy. We look at the, the reaction, right, to Black Lives Matter, to Black Lives, that took a lot of force to get people to listen. And now we're in this, this current progressive movement building era, I will say, right? Like a lot of people are like, oh my God, well, you know, Bernie started a revolution. Nah, movements happen in ways. If you study, if you study your history, you get up from things, movements happen in ways. And we're in a third or fourth wave of some type of social justice, progressive human rights oriented movement building effort, anti-capitalism effort that's happening, you know, depending on where your historical benchmarks are, I'd say this is the third or fourth wave. And and and, and th there are historical issues that underline because this is also America and America is a brain with a racialized history of oppression that also is economic in itself. So we can't separate those two things from each other. We have to deal with them head on. If we're really trying to be transformational revolutionary and powerful in our work, we have to work through uncomfortable moments, even if they involve people that we care about, friends, or we look up to, really got to work through and set the stage. So yesterday, in this whole weekend, just, just seeing the updates from friends and colleagues who were at the Green Party National Meeting, um, you know, seeing live streams and talking to folks, like, it was very empowering. 
I think, to see that even though there was a perceived, you know, problem that needed to be resolved, and, and, and I've experienced it kind of over the social media explosion, you know, even with the tax on the John Baraka recently because of his response to what happened at, in terms of the workshop, he himself actually facilitated UNAC, you know, to see the backlash within the party that's supposed to be the better option for those of us who don't want to deal with the Democrats. It's been kind of disheartening, but at the same time, it's 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 sobering and, re- and, and it's a reaffirmation of how much work we really have to do. I mean, we go back to like the 1890s and Ida B. Wells had to lady birthday to, to the mother Ida B. Wells, whose birthday was yesterday, as well as the side of support. We go back historically and look at the, our movement building. We look at, you know, our pre our predecessors. We do see these instances where even the quote unquote, you know, white allies or good white people were willing to turn on black community or communities they had been building with to their to those people's surprise to get something done that would at least include, you know, at least all white people or all white women. And in this case, we looked at Ida B. Wells' work with the suffrage movement and the way, you know, people different people that she had been working with, people who were colleagues and maybe even good friends were politically were willing to turn on and use racial animus in the South to move certain agendas. Now no, for the most part, it's not that blatant in our work anymore. But there are these undercurrents that still exist in conversations, and I'm going to get to what happened um, for those who still may not be familiar because what I realized is a lot of people reacted to what they saw, the backlash after, you know, Jacqueline Lupin, myself, Owen Grant, and others challenging, you know, the, the characterization of a, of, a, of a movement building space at the UNIT conference. A lot of people reacted to that with notions that it's the Democrats trying to destroy our movement to try and take down our leaders, but we need to stop being so reactionary and take a moment to step back and look at the facts before us. Because if we're truly about building, you know, multiracial coalitions, we're truly about being anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, we really have to get down to the basis. And we cannot be putting ourselves in a position where we're defending intrusions on spaces that are uplifting marginalized communities. So, so uh, I know. Uh, thank you for that, because I, I do want to remind you that that there are going to be many viewers uh, on the live stream who may not actually know what you're talking about. I'm so I'm going to back us. I'm going to back us up for a moment uh, and, and and actually talk about the, the the instances one by one to just sort of talk about the facts before Absolutely. we analyze the facts. So uh, I'd like you to uh, to to start uh, at the conference with Ajamu and the black only space what happened there so so what what happened there was you know unac unac had a conference anti-war conference you know meeting of great minds from all over the place three-day conference in, in richmond virginia anyone's familiar about the activism and organizing that's been going on in richmond virginia recently do you know they've been challenging you know for the removal of confederate monuments and other there's there's active anti-racism you know a, you know, black liberation type work happening on and the ground. So, by the way, that's United National Anti-War Coalition. That's what yes. that stands and for. That's what UNEC stands for. So during the conference, Ajamu's, Ajamu's um, organization, Black Alliance for Peace, had a workshop space. You know, if, if you're not familiar with the way, and I, and I don't mean, and, and people are like, oh, you're talking out of me. Well, some people aren't familiar with the way conferences happen, run, and organized. And I understand that because they are, they can be cost prohibitive. Traveling can be difficult for us. I get it. Absolutely understand. So this is just a, just a really quick, quick, quick primer, not to insult anyone, but just to explain. You know, you'll have breakout sessions, right? You have workshops. You'll have your different panels. You have what they call plenary conversations. But you'll have workshops. And, or, and depending upon how your organization is structured that's running the conference, organizations can submit requests for room space to meet during the conference. Now, many people have said, why would you allow anyone to have space like that that doesn't involve everyone? Well, this is also a time when people are traveling all over the country and in some cases all over the world to be in a place. This is an opportunity for you to meet in person with the people that you've been working with, right? So if the conference competitors actually have the space in the room, they'll let those groups that fit within whatever the priorities and agendas are. And I, I encourage everyone to go look up the website for the, for the 2016 conference read the call to action, understand the purpose and intent, and go check out um, Jacqueline Lupin's video, um, L-U-Q-M-A-N, Lupin. She did a great or she did a great video with some of the organizers, that, and they talked about the purpose and intent of this space and why this was permitted. But, this, but the Black Alliance for Peace had a meeting. On the program, it said, open to all of African descent, right? 
So I did not say that it was closed. This was a workshop. It was an organizational space. It was an organizational space. And there was a, you know, a white, um, you know, she builds herself as an ind independent journalist, Claudia Stauber. And she went, because she, she said, based on a video that she did, she said that she was interested or curious to go to war. So she went. And, you know, at the time when we became aware of it, I, like I said, I had been, I got sick almost immediately after the back of the summit the week before. And part of the reason why a lot of people confused my presence was because we for the pizza, I did leave the black only space. Mine so I know I'm gonna stop you for a moment to just okay. like anchor. And we're having a little bit of trouble with your audio just to let you know. Okay. okay. Uh, but but uh, so at the United National uh, Anti-War Coalition meeting in Virginia, uh, there were a lot of uh, open to the public plenary sessions, a lot of open to anyone workshop sessions, but there was one individual session that was identified as a black only space. Well, it didn't and, say black only, but it said open, the language, you, the language, it didn't say black only, but the language used was African American descendants or, or all African descendants or something to that effect. So. And, and, and the thing is, like, you know, people get into their whole distinction about whether or not that's that's permissible, whether you should have such spaces or not. I'm not, you know, we can debate that philosophically, you know, at some point in time when there's equal. Well, we don't need you here like, because I'll just like this is my show. Oh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is that, that's a whole other conversation. But what I'm but, but the point that was made about this particular space was that, you know, Claudia, there was another gentleman that was there. Nobody was asked to leave. Right. Ajamu did not ask them to leave. He led the conversation. He met with the people were part of the Black Alliance for Peace. And, and, and it turned out there's actually a live stream video of their workshop. You can go watch it. It's on the Black Alliance for Peace uh, Facebook page. But what happened was three days after the comp after this after this workshop, Claudia does a video and she talks about a sensitive topic of racism. And she talks to her predominantly white audience. And you know when you read through the comments on the Facebook page and on the YouTube page, they're they're horrible. We're talking about you know people these people believe in Versus racism as a real concept, and she completely mischaracterizes what this space was. And from the video evidence we had, and from the anecdotal evidence we have, people's conversations with her, she misrepresented her actual experience in that space. I don't know for what purpose, but what happens is she gets publicly challenged by myself, by Jacqueline, and people are like, "Why would you do that publicly? You know, you embarrass her." What she did, and especially when we're talking about people who consider themselves to be part of movements. And then you're a media personality or you consider yourself a journalist, we're representing the work of other people, right? Particularly we're talking about the work of folks in marginalized groups and 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 we're we're in marginalized communities and we're saying we're committed to making things better. And instead of providing context for discussion, who was in the room, whatever the case may be, none of that happened. It was just about the fact that she was upset that it was a black space and that she was not allowed to just live stream because a black woman, and it turns out, you know. That the sister who was doing the streaming was streaming on behalf of the organization specifically because that's what they want to do, and she does not identify as black either. So the charge that she was discriminated against because she was white, the black person maybe she put it, was something that she put forward, and that wasn't even valid either. So that was the initial impetus for the last several weeks of back and forth conversing that ended up happening over, you know, whether or not you know black people can racist and white spaces. And if you've been on Facebook, you can see quite a bit of this all over the place. But it initiated with someone misrepresenting and, and, and essentially disrespecting the work of her colleagues in the peace, in the peace movement, anti-war movement. I mean, because that was a room, like watching the video, there's a room full of people talking about, you know, whether or not they're looking at issues with military recruitment in high school in urban areas, or they're, they're looking at, you know, just different, the way the way the same imperialist policies that we're protesting against abroad, but they're talking about the issues with Syria or Iran or Iraq, whatever, that same mentality affects our, our communities of color here in the United States. So these were the issues, and this was the framing of what was being talked about in that particular space. Now, Ajamu and others from Black Alliance Peace did give, you know, they participate in the other plenary sessions. So some of this information was discussed in a larger setting. But what people need to understand is when these conferences happen, a lot of times what the main, and, and UNAC was a space that actually intentionally tried to include as many voices as possible. And this is one of the ways they did that. But a lot of these different conferences, particularly when we're talking about these larger progressive spaces, and part of this was part of an issue that came up this weekend at the national meeting, if I understand correctly. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I gotta stop you because we uh, before we shift into this weekend, I know. Yeah. 
So uh, Lori writes in to say, uh, we have huge opposition. We need to unite. And Lori, I agree with that. But it's also important to recognize that we live at what we are opposing, I believe, or what I am opposing is a system and a culture that is destroying the planet. Uh, and it is premised upon both patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism, and imperialism, exploitive, oppressive systems uh, that any white person benefits from, whether they want to or not, uh, any man benefits, whether they like it or not. And frankly, anybody who lives in the nation state of the United States of America benefits, even poor people in the United States uh, benefit from a nation state that is premised upon imperialism. So that's my insistence on an intersectional analysis is to be able to understand the objective reality of white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, and imperialism, and doing so, both critiquing it and doing our best to dismantle it and create new institutions that do not devolve into mere class reductionism, which is what I hear some people on the left do, where they say, really, it's just about uh, the eco economic system and capitalism, and we, we shouldn't talk about race or gender or sexual orientation. But neither can it devolve into mere identity politics and not talk about class. These are interrelated things, and we have to learn to have conversation and, and, and really grapple with these sorts of things. And from my way of looking at it, uh, and thank you, Melissa, who writes in to say we all live in a white supremacist society. All white people benefit from that. Absolutely right. So my point is uh, when that sort of thing happens, we have to actually be willing to say, uh, you know, uh, that was a mistake. And, and not, not for it. And, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and not double down on the mistake. And that's the, what I was trying to do in that moment was to point out that mistake. And I know we've only got 10 minutes left in the program. I just want to quickly, just want to quickly say, like, one thing we need to stop doing, because you, 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 it is, it is, I'm not going to say it's a form of violence, but it's definitely a form of, 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 of control. And, 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 and it really turns a lot of people of color off to be told, no, 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 we're not going to talk about that because we have all this opposition. But if you truly understand the nature of the oppressive system that you're saying that you want to combat, that is the United States of America, then there's no way that we can do that without addressing the underpinnings that have been in existence since the country's creation. I mean, this type of stuff, depending upon where you're at, you know, white supremacy, looking at different levels of oppression, I mean, it affects us, whether we're talking about, you know, black folks in whatever community, we're talking about white people in Appalachia. There's a lot of black people in Appalachia in rural areas too. But like that same level of oppression and, 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 and subjugating people, right? We can't just say, oh, we're only going to talk about this stuff because this is what we're comfortable talking about. We got to move beyond what's comfortable, right? We got to right. really be willing to sit there and listen. So for everyone saying like, oh, so-and-so just made a mistake, when you double down on disrespect of your fellow colleagues in the movement, in the struggle, and something that you're saying that you care about, that's a problem. And then when you're an independent journalist, because media, our independent media is so crucial to furthering our movement work, you betrayed the space of other people who are, who are, one, have let you into that space, right? So it's not that you're denied access, not that you can't report on it, but like there's a certain level of integrity and ethics that should be go, that should be involved in our work and reporting and carrying out. And that has continued to manifest itself as several people get more caught up in the ego and the feeling of being what they, what they view as personally attacked, but it's a course correction. I know people are concerned about quote unquote call out culture, but really we need to call attention to these things and correct them where they are with the means that are available to us. So if it's happening publicly, then we need to address it publicly because we're misinforming thousands of people through our media and that's not acceptable. Just like we can't join with people who intentionally misinform whether regardless of what, what they call themselves. But if you're, if you're joining with people who intentionally misinform because supposedly that unification is going to take down the system, there's a bigger problem there than we think. So we've really got to dig deep and figure out what our end goal is, what our actual purpose is, and not just, oh, we all want the same outcome, because that's not necessarily true when we really start parsing out and get down to the potatoes of it. So there's a really deep conversation that's not going to go away. I know a lot of people feel like there's a rift. It's not, it's not going to just magically disappear because Black people or Latinos or whomever agree that we need to stop talking about this and we're just all going to kumbaya and be united because that's that's not true you're asking us 
to be silent and accept something that's just not right. And, and it's not right for you either. Like we, we can't truly have justice and liberation and revolution if, if that's the no, 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 we don't want to do that because that, that's not comfortable. We can't do that. So Jacqueline writes in to say most meetings are open to Caucasians by default. Uh, and the, for her, uh, she writes in, the, we really ought to focus on the fact that the truth was not told uh, about the workshop. Absolutely. So this is the point that I want to make. Uh, I believe a mistake was made. I tried to help correct people who have my pigment to understand uh, where that mistake was. And, whether, and the immediate reaction was defensive and then doubling down. And that, for me, was the most disappointing thing. Not that mis the mistake was initially made. We all make mistakes. I make them all the time. Uh, but I try to conduct myself where somebody points out a mistake, I at least think about it. And I guess that's what I want to encourage folks to really think about is anytime anybody brings something to your attention, and as a white person, if a, if a person of color brings to my attention uh, how they are experiencing me, or if a woman brings to my attention how they're experiencing me, I have trained myself to stop and say, all right, I, like, I don't need to be defensive because I might learn something here. And if they are experiencing me uh, as a racist or a sexist, then I am not conducting myself in the way that I want to be experienced. And of course that happens all the time because of the society we live in. As, as Lou writes in to say, we live in a white supremacist society. And that, that is just the reality. Happened, but this was, I, 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 can't, I can't stomach that this was a mistaken because when you watch the characterization and then you go and watch the footage of someone, of Claudia purposefully, right? Smiling, asking a question, engaged. There is no mistake. You go to lunch with people. She went to lunch with people from back afterwards. There's no mistake there. Now, now it's possible she does not have the right nuance for racial relations in America to understand. That's possible. But ignorance of, 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 of whether it's the law or anything is not an excuse for the way we actively misrepresent. Because there was ample opportunity for herself, for, for anyone else that was involved and continues to attack Ajamu and myself and others throughout this whole process. You know, certain person who's no longer allegedly with the Green Party, who's now supposedly a Democrat. There were plenty of opportunities for people to, to correct. Like you said, they could have corrected that initial misunderstanding if you didn't have the facts. But with Claudia, I don't believe that that was a mistake. She may have in her own mind misinterpreted, but there was a whole complete narrative that just, that just did not match the facts. And I think far too often part of the uncomfortableness, because we do have work with people, we do respect people, we're, we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But when something happens so publicly and in such a, a, a disrespectful and undermining way, because this is really good work that Ajamu and others are doing. And, you know, this is not even like I'm a Ajamu, like super fan or anything. I respect his work. I respect what he does. I don't agree with him on absolutely everything. I don't think anyone agrees with him on absolutely everything. But I, I don't agree with myself time. all the time. So <laughs> I, I, I saw something happening that was wrong. And I knew that that was a mischaracterization. And for those of us who continue who claim to be in the media, uh, in a, and not just in the media, but a part of a movement building space, we have a duty and obligation to make sure the work of our comrades is being respected. Whether we uh, whether we agree with it, that's a whole other story. You can, you can disagree with someone, but do so respectfully. And so we have to be able to move these conversations forward and get beyond this, this, this petty ball of ego and feeling that is being spilled out all over the place. And looking towards what happened this weekend, with, with, with the Black Caucus and other folks within the Green Party, you know, standing up and saying, hey, we have a problem, even us as Greens internally in this space. And I guess it's uncomfortable. No, we're not going to be quiet about it. Yes, we're going to do something. So I know we've only got we've only got three minutes left. And I do want to actually compare and contrast the experience at the United uh, National Anti-War Coalition with the Green Party and to contextualize it for people. Here are the objective facts. The objective facts are that the Green Party met in Newark. Uh, several hundred uh, Greens from all over the country came. Uh, there was an election uh, for a steering committee, which is the executive body for the National Green Party. Uh, there are already many people of color on it, uh, including an African-American. Uh, there were four spots open. Uh, of those four spots, there were seven candidates. Uh, using a ranked choice voting system, uh, there were three of those uh, seven candidates were African-Americans. Uh, 
of the four elected, there was there were two Latinas, uh, a white woman, and a young uh, non-gender conforming uh, uh, white person. The three, none of the three uh, African Americans were elected. Uh, the Black Caucus was meeting when the results came off, uh, and they were incredibly upset, and I would say completely understandably so. Uh, and they self-organized themselves. They went to the the the, the Latinx Caucus. Uh, they they brought in the newly emerging Indigenous Caucus, uh, the Women's Caucus, and they marched together. Uh, 50 strong to uh, the place where we were going to do a fundraiser uh, and Channing uh, uh, shut it down, shut it down. And the Green Party leaders who were there literally stopped and said, we're clearly not going to do a fundraiser. You are members of this party. This space is yours. We opened it up and spent the rest of the evening uh, listening to, uh, and for folks who want to watch it, you can just go online and see it was live streamed and so forth. Yeah. And then the yeah. next day, we literally spent the time trying to deconstruct uh, what happened, why it happened, and come up with, and I hope that we will ultimately come up with formal structural changes in how the Green Party of the United States operates uh, to, to dismantle and deconstruct these kind of results. And I'm not looking to break my arm, patting myself on the back, uh, Noah, as a member of the Green Party, but there is a difference between how we as a party reacted to that moment and how I see other, frankly, organizations and parties reacting when this well, sort of it, stuff. Well, 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 to back it up, a big portion of what's happening right now and how that space even came to be happening, you know, this weekend was this is the culmination of a lot of people struggling internally at different chapters all over the place. And there's quite a few people. And there's a group run by Greens, right? People who claim to be Greens right now. So there is a really deep seated issue. But what I said to I think it was Andy Ellis of the Baltimore Greens, what I said recently was there is a deep seated issue. There is a really great platform stance, but there, but it's still this is America. There are white people. It's still going to be a problem. No, it doesn't mean all people are evil, but there is something that is embedded in the culture and the way we interact and do stuff that has to be addressed. And a culture change is necessary within our movements, within our parties. What I do acknowledge, though, is the fact that people were able to collectively organize and did feel that that party, the Green Party, is worth it and that they were able to raise their voices collectively and that the response was what it was. Now, I know that there's not, there, I mean, there, there, I'm not, I know, but there could be people who aren't happy with that on the flip side. But at the same time, the fact that the party recognizes the need to change is a good thing going forward. But we can't we can't deny the fact that there has been a historical issue even within the Greens. There's a historical issue within the Democrats. There's a historical look, it's, issue. It's, yeah, it's, be, it's because we live in the United States of America. So I mean, the reality America. is that America. anything that is created in this country, if it is not created with intentional, deliberate understanding yeah, of yeah, white yeah, supremacy yeah. and patriarchy and capitalism and imperialism, then it will reflect those things whether you want it to or not. And I'm going to own the fact that we have not done sufficient work in the Green Party, uh, both in terms of our own structures, but also in terms of our own internal political education around any of those things. And about rather than run away from it, I want to lean into it. I want to recognize that there's work to do and let's do the work. No, absolutely. So I know we are out of time. I just want to say if you guys are paying attention to any of the coverage from the media, the media, uh, uh, the democracy convention, there's two panels. There's a media revolt panel. And then there's another panel that I'm doing on the racial justice uh, convention section. Um, and I, I just play around with three different names. I can't remember what we titled it anymore. But it's talking about, you know, building, you know, good alliances, you know, moving from ally, ally to comrade, building better movement spaces, basically what we've been talking about now. Um, you know, I'm really excited with, with the group who's going to be with me. I'll be tweeting more about it. You guys can catch me on Twitter at The Way of Fanoa. You can follow me on Facebook or you can shoot me an email, thewayoffanoa at gmail.com. David, I thank you so much. Definitely check us out at MediaRevolt.org as well. Looking for an alternative for Facebook and the corporate control of media. I mean, seriously, media democracy is super crucial and important. Definitely come check us out at MediaRevolt.org. It just launched. We're in our soft launch phase, so um, but it's pretty cool so far. So thank you. And you can you can meet Anoa Changa in person and Michael Salomon, her producer and co colleague and comrade uh, at Media Revolt at the Democracy. Yeah. 
at the Democracy Convention, which is coming up August 2 through 6 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, you don't have to go to the entire time. There's still, uh, so there's still space available. We expect over 500 people from across the country. Uh, uh, Noah and Michael and Melicia will be doing a session specifically uh, on media and democracy. Uh, they'll also be covering it as journalists themselves. Uh, I would say embedded journalists, uh, democracy activists, and uh, uh, racial justice and economic justice activists. So, Anoa, I want to thank you so much. There was so much to say. I know that we didn't get a chance to do everything, but yeah. let, let's, let's keep talking. Let's keep working. I want to thank you for being who you are, what you do. Folks, if you liked what you heard, hell, even if you didn't like what you hear, make comments on this. Share it with other people. Uh, remember that in the words of Gil Scott Heron, the revolution will not be televised, but it can be brought to you over non-corporately sources of news information and analysis like MediaRevolt.org, like the Green News Network, and this program, Democracy in Action. Peace.